Um, thank you guys all for joining us this morning for our May 1st Saturday seminar. My name is Marissa Blackburn. If you don't know me, I'm the environmental education manager here at Cape Fear River Watch. Um, and this mic is not supposed to be projecting my voice, so don't worry, just ignore it. Um, it's for our recording, which we will have up on YouTube um, next week if you are interested in sharing this presentation with anyone. Um, I, as always, am going to share a couple announcements for Riverwatch, and then I'm going to um, turn it over to our Riverkeeper to introduce our speaker today. But um, we have a lot of upcoming events. It's a busy time of year for us. Um, next Saturday, we have our second Saturday cleanup. We will be cleaning up um, the Burnt Mill Creek uh, watershed, the McCumbers um, branch portion of that. Uh, the intersection of Rankin and 11th. So let me know if you're interested. I will actually be heading th up that one next week um, in place of Rob. Uh, the following Saturday, we have our third Saturday paddle. We'll be paddling also Burnt Mill Creek to Smith Creek to the Northeast Cape Fear River and then the Cape Fear River. So keeping it close to, close to home. Um, we also have our last spring eco tour, one hour um, guided walking eco tour with our AmeriCorps uh, environmental educator, uh, Kristen. That's going to be on uh, May 23rd, which is Tuesday. And then in June, on June 1st, we have our second annual State of the River event um, symposium. It's going to be a, a day long event from 8 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Lunch and breakfast are included um, for free. It's a free event, although we are accepting donations at registration and we encourage you all to attend and tell your friends um, and family and have them attend too. Um, last year we had about 300 people there and we hope to have even more than that this year for our second annual event. Um, we have an info sheet on the front table and there's also a QR code. Um, if you want to scan that with your um, with your cell phone, you can actually it'll take you right to the registration page, and you can register today before you leave. Um, last night, our intern Sydney had a Zine Fest. A Zine is a mini magazine that she designed with her and um, some of her um, friends who are artists. And so, also on the front table are some of her mini magazines. Uh, you can grab those to go. They're all on different environmental issues that the Riverwatch works on that she learned about this semester, and then she turned into little um, informational magazines, which are really amazing. So you should check those out. Up front, we have lots of free seed packets. So before you leave today, if you want to get some flowers or vegetables or any other seeds, feel free to take some seed packets. Those are available for you all. Um, if you haven't signed in, the sign-in sheet should be going around somewhere, I think. Uh, so please just make sure you write your name down on that. We are accepting donations um, at the front table if you are interested um, to support our free seminar series. And I would like to point out a couple people here. On our board, we have Dr. Larry Cahoon, if you just want to raise your hand. And we also have Ted Poucher, if you, sorry, if you want to raise your hand right there. Um, and then I also want to turn it over to Tom Tui for a minute because he wants to make an announcement. So. Awesome. So I'm real 
Wilshire Boulevard. There's a little church there. Uh, and right at, of course, at Creek, there's a, you can see the sidewalks all torn up. And where they took down the birch, some of the birch trees that I planted. And so um, I really invite everybody to come and Pep already did a tour with me. I called him up as soon as I saw this happen. Right, great. Yeah, so you can chat with Tom afterwards if you're interested in that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to our Riverkeeper Kemp, and he will introduce our speaker. All right. Hey, everybody. It's been a while since I've been at First Saturday Seminar. It's kind of nice. Um, I have a uh, official introduction here that I'm going to read to make sure that I get the details right, but um, I'm going to introduce Chrissy, who I have dinner with every night, and as you can imagine, two people that work on CAFOs, uh, dinner conversation can be kind of interesting. Uh, it, it is kind of fun though because Chrissy works uh, on CAFOs from a much larger scale than we do. So like she's working all over the country, several states, doing big uh, federal kind of level work and, and state level work too. But um, And then, you know, Cape Fear River Watch, we tend to focus just on the Cape Fear Watershed. So I learn a ton from Chrissy. Um, she's incredibly smart and organized and strategic. Um, and those of you who know me, like that's kind of the opposite of what I am, right? Um, <laughs> So I'm going to officially uh, introduce Chrissy uh, here, and then we'll get started. Uh, Chrissy Kasserman is Food and Water Watch, Food and Water, Food and Water's Factory Farm Organizing Director. Uh, Chrissy works to take Food and Water Watch's fight against factory farms to the next level in battling corporate agriculture at the state and federal level in order to work towards a more sustainable, safer, and equitable food system. Chrissy has over 20 years experience in environmental advocacy and rural, or rural organizing and has a master's in community and economic development from Penn State University where she studied the impacts of shale gas drilling on tourism in rural, rural Pennsylvania. Prior to joining Food and Water Watch, Chrissy spent 12 years in western Pennsylvania as the Yakagani Riverkeeper. Uh, she grew up in West Virginia along the Ohio River where she learned to swim before she learned to walk. So I'll turn it over, and she doesn't need this. Yeah. Right? Okay. are where we are with this food system because of decades of misguided farm and food policy. Um, I think there's a kind of a sentiment out there that, you know, as the country grows and as we industrialize that the food system is going to grow and industrialize along with us. And that really isn't the case. Like we used to have a food system in this country that worked for people who eat food and the people that grew our food. Um, and we don't have that anymore because our, our farm policy and our food policy um, has really been designed by these big agribusiness corporations that dominate it today. Um, and so when I say agribusiness, I want you to think like Bear Monsanto and Syngenta, um, but also a lot of the big corporations um, that actually grow and process our food. So Smithfield and Tyson and Purdue, um, but then also like General Mills and Kellogg's and those big brands, Kraft Foods, that you see um, commonly in the grocery store. Um, so anyway, our food system, the food system we have today is the result of deliberate policy choices. It is not inevitable. Um, a lot of times you'll hear people say the food system is broken. Um, that makes sense. It isn't working for us as consumers. It isn't working for farmers. But it actually is functioning in, in exactly the way it was designed to function which is to raise money for these big corporations and their shareholders um, at the expense of us as consumers and, and as farmers. Um, so it's, you know, is it broken? A lot, of, a lot of environmental justice groups take issue with that language um, because it is, it's working the way it was designed to. Um, but it's not working for us. So today, one in seven households with children is food insecure. Median farm income is negative and has been for years and years. People are losing money to grow our food. Um, slaughterhouse workers suffer double the rate of illness and injury than workers in the manufacturing sector as a whole. Um, and our rural communities are really in free fall with the demise of um, family scale farms. Um, and so this food system, as I said, not inevitable, not working for us, but working in the way it was designed to work. 
So concentration is really the defining characteristic of our food system today. Um, and so concentration it essentially measures the extent to which the market is controlled by a small number of firms. Um, so when you have higher concentration, you have fewer firms controlling the market, you have lower competition. And so lower competition harms us as consumers and also the farmers who grow our food. Um, I have terrible allergies um, and I am not sick. <laughs> I just want to tell those of you in the front row that, um, but the pollen count is really high today, so bear with me, I'm sorry. And the smoke is not helping, yes. Um, all right, so I'll give, you, I'll give you a quick example. This is, this is um, pretty crude, but it, it'll get the point across. So um, I was in a grocery store in town the other day, and I saw a bag of artisan granola, which I did not know was a thing that existed. Um, but so imagine we live here in Wilmington, North Carolina, and there are three companies making artisan granola. And they're selling that granola in stores around town for like five or six bucks a bag. And so they're competing with one another, right, for, for our business. Everybody wants us to buy their granola. So say one of those small companies decides to buy out one of the others. So we would call that an acquisition. And so now all of a sudden, we have two firms making artisan granola in Wilmington. So we as consumers now have fewer choices. Instead of choosing between three kinds of granola, we can only choose between two. And um, those granola companies now have a little more leeway in terms of where they set the price, right? They might, instead of charging five or six bucks a bag, be able to charge seven or eight bucks a bag. So now let's say those two artisan granola companies decide to merge and become one company. So now we have one company in all of Wilmington selling artisan granola, and we as consumers now have no choice. If we wanna buy artisan granola, we have to buy it from this one company that exists. And because that company now has no competition, they can do whatever they want with the price, right? So now they can charge 10 bucks a bag for their granola. So that's a really basic example, but that's essentially what's happening in our food system um, as a whole. So these companies, like the companies that I just named, um, you know, S Smithfield, Tyson, Syngenta, um, Kellogg's, um, they get bigger and bigger by gobbling up their competitors and eliminating their competition. And so for us as consumers, that means we pay more for our food and we have fewer choices. Um, and so across the board in our food system today, there's just a handful of companies that are controlling the market for almost every agricultural product. Um, and when I say agricultural product, I want you to think like things that are grown on farms that we can eat. So you know, crops, beans, collards, tomatoes, what have you. Um, but you should also think about the commodity crops that are grown and turned into a lot of the processed food that we eat, like corn and soy. Um, and then you should also think about the products that are made with that corn and soy. So, you know, cereal or granola bars, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the market for almost all of the food that we eat today is controlled by just a handful of companies. And so that really leaves us as, as consumers and also farmers at the mercy of these big agribusinesses. Um, this is like a Food and Water Watch classic slide. It's been around for decades. Um, this is the best way we have, we have come up with to sort of represent what our food system today looks like. And so what you have at the top are the roughly 2 million or so farmers who grow our food. What you have at the bottom are the 330 or so million of us who eat food in this country, which includes everybody in this room. And then in the middle, you have these very few agribusinesses and food companies that really control kind of every aspect of the market. And so they stand between us and the people who grow our food. Um, that gives them tremendous power over every step in the food chain from seeds to slaughterhouses to supermarkets. And um, at each step along the production process, they control the choices for us as consumers, and they control the amount of money that our farmers can earn for growing our food. So these companies, through this market power, have really become the deciders um, in, in matters of both policy and farm practice. And they also are the primary barrier to us making a meaningful shift to a more sustainable and more equitable food system. Um, and the reason they're a barrier is because they are very invested in the status quo 
um, because the status quo generates lots of money for them and lots of money for their shareholders. So it's this corporate control that really um, has entrenched this, this food system that we have now. So these companies that run the middle of the hourglass control um, the, the processing, the distribution, and the retailing of our food. And this gives them an enormous amount of control over how and where and by whom our food is grown. Um, I think there is sort of a misconception um, that, that you know, our, our food choices um, kind of drive what is produced and marketed in this country. And that's really not always the case because of the power here in the middle of the hourglass. Um, also in this country, um, economic power tends to translate to political power. And because of decisions like Citizens United and others, money is speech. Um, and so these corporations at the center of the hourglass exert an enormous amount of influence over our elected officials in order to get and keep power. So this is, this is kind of our summary. Um, it is a system designed to funnel money into the hands of corporate shareholders and executives while exploiting farmers and workers and deceiving consumers about choice, abundance, and efficiency. We call it the foodopoly, um, which is a play on monopoly. Um, it's also the name of a book our executive director wrote about this, um, which I'll tell you a bit more about in a bit. Um, but essentially, Markets where the top four companies control more than 40% of sales are generally considered to be pretty consolidated. Um, those that exceed 60% are thought of as monopolies. And so in this country today, four companies sell 85% of corn and 76% of soybean seeds. Four companies control 84% of the pesticide market. Four companies slaughter almost 70% of all hogs. One of those is Smithfield. Four companies slaughter over 60% of all poultry. And four companies take in 65% of grocery sales um, in this country. And so this is what we mean when we say we have excessive consolidation in our food system. All right, so we'll, we'll step into the supermarket for a minute. Um, so this graph shows the national market share of the four largest grocery retailers in this country. Um, so I'll give you the percentages. Walmart controls 28.6% of the grocery market in this country. Um, Kroger, which owns Harris Teeter, controls 16.5% of the market. Um, Ahold Delhaize, which owns Food Lion and Giant, controls about 10%. Um, and Costco controls about 10%. So these are the four companies where, you know, 65% of groceries in this, in this country are purchased. Um, up until the mid-90s, most supermarkets and grocery stores in this country were small or regional, kind of, you know, fairly independent chains. Um, I grew up in a tiny little town in West Virginia. Um, we had a IGA, which was owned by the Herrick family, which lived in town. And we had a Witchies, which was owned by Bill Witchie, who also lived in town. And that was the case in most communities across the country. Um, and then when Walmart entered the grocery market in the mid to late 90s, those independent grocery stores disappeared very, very fast. Um, and a lot of, so what happened, and this is kind of what consolidated the industry so, quick, so quickly, a lot of those smaller regional chains felt the need to merge with other smaller regional chains in order to be able to compete against Walmart. Um, and so you had a, a wave of mergers for that reason. Um, and you had regulators who approved all of those mergers because they knew that those small independent chains were not going to be able to compete with Walmart unless they became bigger. Um, and so today you have these four firms, you know, selling two thirds of groceries. Um, and I will will also say this level of consolidation can be much, much higher on the local level. So the town that I grew up in, both of those independent grocery stores have been replaced by Walmart. And Walmart is now the only place in that town where you can buy groceries. You would have to drive an hour to buy groceries from a, you know, a different grocery store um, where I grew up. And that didn't just happen in my town. Like that's happened in just about every small town across the country. Um, and so like there are lots and lots of people out there who have zero choice when it comes to where they're going to purchase their groceries. And so this level of consolidation allows for, again, increased prices and decreased choice for us as consumers. 
We call this the craft octopus. Um, so what this slide shows is the market share of one of these big food conglomerates um, of the products listed up here. So you can see that Kraft sells 33% of the mayonnaise in this country. Kraft sells 35% of the lunch meat. Almost half of the processed cheese sold in this country is Kraft. 80%, 79.9% of the dry mac and cheese sold in this country is sold by Kraft. Um, and so what this means for you as a consumer, when a corporation like Kraft is negotiating with a grocery store um, for that grocery store to be able to sell their products, you know, maybe that grocery store comes to Kraft and they're like, we want to sell your dry mac and cheese. And so, I mean, if you want to sell dry mac and cheese in this country, it has to be Kraft because they sell 80% of it. And so Kraft will say, sure, you can have our dry mac and cheese, but you also have to take our lunch meat and our salad dressing and our mustard and our processed cheese. And so in this way, Kraft has an enormous amount of control over what you see in your grocery store um, on those shelves. And so um, these manufacturers, you know, they decide what's on the shelves. A lot of them are powerful enough that they can actually decide which of their competitors' products end up on the shelves. Um, they also can decide where the product placement is happening on grocery store shelves. So when you walk in the grocery store, those products that are like at eye level, front and center on the shelves, they're there for a reason. And that's because they are being marketed by one of these really powerful food conglomerates that has negotiated for better placement on the grocery store shelves. Um, this is also why it's so difficult if you are making artisan granola in Wilmington, North Carolina. You know, it's pretty unlikely you're gonna be able to get that granola onto the Harris Teeter shelves around here because these big food conglomerates are negotiating to keep you out of that space so that you buy their products instead. Um, and I will say this happens with meat too. This isn't just um, unique to Kraft and Kellogg's. Um, so Tyson Chicken uh, owns Hillshire Farms pork. So a lot of times when Tyson is negotiating with a grocery store, they'll say, yeah, you can sell our chicken, but you also have to take Hillshire Farms pork because we also own that. Um, and so, you know, in that way, they're, they're in control. You know, it's not, it's not just the laws of supply and demand that determine what you see in the grocery store. Um, it's actually negotiations like this happening with these big, powerful food conglomerates um, behind the scenes that control what you have available to you as a consumer. Um, I want to talk a minute about branding um, because a lot of times when you're in the, in the grocery store, say you're in the grocery store and you're, you're standing in front of the dry mac and cheese section and you're looking at like the various types of mac and cheese that are available for you to buy. And you know, maybe there's 10 different kinds. There's 10 different boxes of dry mac and cheese. And so you're looking, you know, reading the labels, looking at the ingredients, trying to figure out which makes sense. Um, but the reality is, because Kraft owns 80% of the market share in dry mac and cheese in this country, you're not actually deciding between one box of mac and cheese and another box of mac and cheese. You're deciding between Kraft and Kraft. And so, you know, all of these different products are frequently owned by the same big food corporation. They're just marketed differently to appeal to different types of consumers. Um, and a lot of times the products are pretty identical. It's just the branding that is different. Um, and so we call this the illusion of choice. Um, so, you know, you're in the grocery store and you're like, hmm, should I buy this product or this product? But really, you know, you, you don't have a choice. You're just funneling your, your dollars to Kraft or to Kellogg's or, you know, whoever it is. Um, and so this is why this problem isn't going to be solved by us shopping our way out of this. The choices that we make at the grocery store are not going to solve this problem. What we really need to solve this problem um, is policy change. And I will say too, um, the natural food, foods market is very, very much the same. So I think, um, you know, when you go in the grocery store and you're looking at like Kashi or Cascadian Mills or Boca Burger, um, all three of those are owned by, you know, these giant food agribusinesses. Um, and so, you know, you, you may think you're making a better choice. Um, and in some ways you are, you know, Kashi, um, Kashi buys grains from farmers that are transitioning from conventional to organic agriculture. That's a really hard time to be a farmer. And so that's great. Um, but the, the big profits from your purchase of Kashi cereal are going to Kellogg's. Um, 
which is not to say that you shouldn't make better food decisions when you can. Um, so, you know, Kemp and I have a CSA, um, Community Supported Agriculture. We get a box of veggies from um, Redbeard Farms, which is like five miles up the road from us in, Wil um, or in Pender County. Um, and we love it, it's great. Um, you should do that if you can, but the problem with, with that being replicated on a large scale is of access and affordability. So there are a lot of people in this country that don't have access to fresh produce that's you know bought from an independent local farm. Um, there are a lot of food deserts in this country. Most people think urban areas, there are growing food deserts and hunger in um, rural America too. And so that's not an issue that's available to a lot of people. And it also costs a premium, right? You're spending more to be able to shop at a farmer's market or from a local independent farmer than you would be if you were going to Walmart or to Food Lion. Um, and so that's another reason why our personal choices at the grocery store um, are not gonna solve this problem. What we really need is um, policy change. Yeah. What about store brands? Now, are they actually made by Kroger um, so those store brands that you see, they'll be branded Harris Teeter or Kroger or whatever Walmart's brand is called, um, but they are generally manufactured by these same big manufacturers and they just negotiate for the branding. Yep, yep. Yeah, so a lot of times, you know, you'll see the product will be identical um, between, you know, the store brand and the name brand. It'll, the, the name brand will cost more, um, but a lot of times the products are, this, are the same and they're made by the same, um, the same company. Good question. All right, so we'll talk now about um, kind of how this consolidation in the food system has really harmed independent farming in this country and really given rise to the big factory farms that we see today. Um, so you've, we use the term factory farm at Food and Water Watch um, mostly because the industry really hates it, um, and so we like to make them mad when we can. Um, but you've probably also heard these factory farms referred to as contract farms or as CAFOs, um, which is the term that's used in our in like the regulatory landscape. Um, CAFO stands for concentrated animal feeding operations. Um, so all these terms are kind of interchangeable. Um, but essentially what we're referring to when we're talking about a factory farm is a place where, um, I hesitate to call them barns, <laughs> um, but it's, you know, these, these you, you've seen them if you've driven anywhere in eastern North, rural eastern North Carolina, but big series of um, buildings lined up, very industrial, no windows. Um, it's a place where large numbers of food animals are raised in confinement. Their food is brought to them, so they're not able to engage in their normal feeding or foraging behaviors. And because they're concentrated in one space, their waste is all then concentrated in one space in huge quantities um, that it's impossible to dispose of like safely and sustainably. Um, so, you know, these enormous quantities of animal manure are a threat to our rivers and streams, people living nearby, our public health, our quality of life. Um, we, we could go on for an hour about that. Um, so, but it hasn't always been this way. We have not always raised animals in factory farms. Um, and so previously, many decades ago, um, we were raising animals for food on small diversified farming operations. Um, and everybody has an image of this in their head, right? It's the old McDonald, it's the red barn, um, it's, it's the animals on pasture. And this is how our food was raised until, you know, the, 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 the CAFO or factory farm model came into being. Um, and so on these smaller diversified farms, you would have a farmer who would have maybe 50 hogs and maybe, you know, 20 milk cows, 20 or 30 beef cattle, um, maybe 100 chickens. They'd be growing um, crops that people could actually eat. So, you know, beans and tomatoes and lettuce. Um, and they would be using the manure from the animals that they were growing to fertilize those crops. Um, and because they were doing that, they didn't have to then rely on synthetic fertilizer that oftentimes is derived from fossil fuels. So it was a much more sustainable operation. Um, and, but the reality is that it, it's nearly impossible to survive as an independent farmer running a farming operation like that, like that in this current food system. Um, Negative farm income um, has been the case for, I think, 24 of the last 25 years. Um, 
And most of these people who are still trying to make it as an independent farm are only able to survive because of off-farm income. Um, so, you know, somebody else in the family has a job that's, that's off the farm. Um, it's, it's just very, very difficult to, to be able to make a living um, with a diversified farming operation right now. And that's because of the level, we'll talk a little more about this, but that's because of the level of consolidation in the food system today. Um, so this is just a, a graph that is a little reminder of some of those um, numbers that we talked about a little earlier. So this shows the market share of the top four processing firms for beef cattle, um, poultry, and hogs, monopolies, all of them. Um, and so when there are fewer companies available to buy animals from farmers, um, there's a long-term downward pressure on the prices that farmers receive um, for their animals. And so, you know, if you're a family farmer, it's very difficult for you to negotiate with these huge meat packing corporations to take your animals for slaughter. Um, so, you know, 50 years ago, we had a lot of small and regional um, processing facilities, not only here in North Carolina, but around the country. Um, and most of those are gone now. They've been, they've been either gobbled up by the big industrial slaughterhouses, um, or they've, you know, they've had to close because they can't compete. Um, and so that's left only these big, huge meat packing plants, like the Tar Heel plant up the road here. Um, and those big meat packing plants don't want to negotiate with you as an independent farmer to buy your 50 hogs. It is easier and more efficient for them to take animals from factory farms because those animals are more uniform in size, they're more uniform in weight, it makes the slaughter, slaughter line run faster, um, and it's just easier for them to take animals off of their own factory farms than to negotiate. You know, they could get 5,000 hogs off of one farm, or they could negotiate with 100 people selling 50 hogs each, right? So. Um, in terms of efficiency, they just don't want to buy animals from independent farmers. And so that has meant that you as an independent farmer um, in this current landscape could, could literally have nowhere to sell your animals for slaughter and processing. This level of consolidation in meat packing is increasing. So what this graph shows is the market share of the top four processing firms from 1980 to 1995 to 2017. So you can see in 1980, um, the top four firms in both beef cattle, which is blue, and hogs, which, are, which is pink, um, was somewhere around a third. Um, so we wouldn't even have called that consolidated necessarily. Um, most animals at that point were still being slaughtered in small scale regional slaughter facilities. Um, by 1995, you could see it's jumped way up for, for beef cattle and increased pretty substantially for, for hogs. Um, and by 2017, you can see we have monopoly levels of consolidation um, in both. And so, again, you know, if you were, I wish I had a graph to show this, I don't, but if you were to look at the trajectory of like the rise of factory farms and the decline of um, family scale farms, I think there would be a pretty good, pretty good relationship here. Um, and so this level of consolidation in meat packing has really gutted profit for farmers. And so what you're looking at here is the price that a farmer would receive per hundred weight of hogs, that's a hundred pounds of hog, um, in January 2020 dollars from 1980 through 2019. So you can see in 1980, if you were to sell a hundred weight of hogs, you should expect to get about $129 um, for that. And in 2020, these are the last numbers we have, um, that's gone down to about 53 bucks. So your profit um, selling the same thing in 1980 to, to 2019 has been cut by more than half. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, this increasing power and market consolidation by those firms in the middle of the hourglass um, has, has been responsible for gutting profits for farmers. So now, when you go to the supermarket, um, you know, imagine the hourglass, right? So we have the farmers at the top. We have um, those of us eating food at the bottom. We have all those agribusiness corporations, kind of the bottleneck in the middle. And they're capturing 85% of every dollar you spend at the grocery store. So 
you know, 15% of every dollar that you spend at Walmart or Kroger or Harris Teeter um, actually makes it back to the farmer who grew the food. 85% um, of it is, is stuck in the middle of the hourglass in those processing and marketing um, functions. And so I can give you a couple quick examples um, for a few specific products. So every year, the National Farmers Union puts together a list of products and what farmers earn when we buy those products. Um, so if you were to go to the grocery store today and buy a pound of lettuce for $2.49, the farmer who grew that lettuce would get 31 cents. If you were to buy two pounds of bread for $4.49, the farmer would get 20 cents. Um, if you were to buy one pound of boneless ham for $12.98, the farmer would get 81 cents. Um, and so, you know, it's impossible to survive as an independent farmer. Um, and that, I think, is, is one of the factors, you know, the demise of family scale farming and, um, and the level of consolidation in our food system has, has really led a lot of farmers to sign contracts to grow animals for, for corporations like Smithfield and Tyson and Purdue. Um, because in a lot of ways, they have very few choices. You know, a lot of these folks are on land that's been in their families for generations. They live in the middle of nowhere in rural North Carolina where there's not a lot of other economic opportunity. Um, and, you know, you can't survive running a small diversified farming operation. So what are you going to do? Um, so that's, that's a, you know, a corner that a lot of people have been backed into. Um, I've also heard anecdotally, and there are probably people in this room who know more about this than I do, um, but that in North Carolina, when the big tobacco settlements happened and the bottom fell out of the tobacco market, you also had a lot of farmers throughout the state who had previously been growing tobacco who now had no market for the product they had grown you know, for, for decades or longer. Um, and so a lot of those people then signed contracts to, to um, operate factory farms because again, you know, land rich, money poor, in the middle of rural North Carolina, no other economic opportunities. So what we've seen um, are these family scale farms of the past being pushed out by factory farms. Um, that's a result of declining farm wages, a shift to larger slaughterhouses that don't purchase animals from small independent farmers. Um, and so farmers have turned to these contracts in order to be able to continue farming. So in this model, um, we call the, the corporations or the companies um, the integrators, um, and they contract with growers um, to raise birds or livestock. And so we call these companies or these systems vertically integrated because the companies essentially control every step in the production process. Um, so to give you an example, if you're um, you know, Tyson Foods and you sign a contract with Tyson Foods to grow to grow chickens. Um, those chickens are gonna be hatched in a Tyson hatchery. Uh, they are gonna be delivered to your farm in a Tyson truck. Um, you are gonna raise them with food that you obtain from Tyson and with veterinary care that Tyson provides. Um, you are, when those birds are ready to go to slaughter, the Tyson truck is gonna come back, pick them up, take them to a Tyson slaughterhouse, and they're gonna be slaughtered and processed, and then they're gonna land on the grocery store shelves with Tyson branding. So Tyson controls every step in the process, and that's what we call um, vert vertical integration. So this level of control gives these companies a lot of power. Um, they own the animals, they own the animals throughout their lives, even when they're on these contract farms. Um, you as the farmer don't own these animals. Um, they set the terms of the contract, they dictate all aspects of raising the animals, um, and so suddenly you as a farmer don't own anything of value in this supply chain. Um, all, all of the things of value belong to the integrator. Um, and we, we could talk for an hour about the impact that this has had on rural communities, but imagine, you know, if you were running the small red barn farm of the past, you were buying your feed from a local feed mill and you were relying on a local veterinarian for veterinary care. You probably had an accountant to help you with your books who was probably also local. And so that was all money that you as a local farmer were pumping back into the economy in these small rural communities, which now, you know, all of those services are being run by these big integrators. So that's money that is no longer circulating in our rural, rural communities. Um, 
We could talk a lot about the state of rural America today. Um, we won't, but, but a big part of the reason that our rural communities are really being hollowed out um, is the demise of family scale farming operations. So this slide shows basically what we just talked about, who owns what, um, the company or the grower. Um, and you can see here that essentially all of the liabilities are on the grower's side of this balance sheet, right? So you as the grower have to take out the debt to build these barns to the integrator's exact specifications. Oftentimes that's in the millions of dollars. So you're taking out a couple million dollar loan. You have to maintain the barn. Oftentimes these specifications change over time. So you might build this barn and they might come back to you in a year and say, we need you to do a million dollars worth of upgrades. Um, and there you are going back to the bank for another million dollars on, on your loan. Um, you provide the labor, you cover the cost of the utilities. And most importantly, you as the grower are entirely responsible for the waste that is generated on these contract farms. Um, and that's, of course, the biggest liability of all, right? Which we, we know from um, Hurricane Florence and, and you know, other, other incidents here in eastern North Carolina. And these big meat com companies, they own everything of value. So um, they own the genetic patent, which is very valuable. Um, they own the animals themselves throughout their lifespans. They own the feed. They own the medicine. They provide the trucking. They own the slaughter facility. And then they own the brand that these, these products are eventually sold under. Um, I'll give you a quick example of um, the, the biggest problem in this system, especially from our perspective as folks who care about environmental issues. Um, it's a little gross, but Kemp already said we talk about manure um, nonstop at the dinner table. So um, I have a friend who, uh, who was trying to explain this concept to folks a couple years ago, and um, he drew a chicken on a chalkboard, and then he drew that chicken pooping. And he's like, okay, so before this chicken poops, while the poop is inside the chicken, it belongs to the company, right? Because the, the bird belongs to the company. But then at some point between the chicken pooping and the poop hitting the barn floor, it changes hands, right? And then by the time it hits the barn floor, it's owned entirely by the grower who is responsible for disposing it, of it. Um, and so that's one of the biggest issues with this model. Um, I firmly believe that if these big meat companies were forced to be responsible for the waste that their animals generate, um, that we would have done away with the Lagoon and Sprayfield system in North Carolina a really long time ago. Um, you know, if we were able to go after Smithfield for the pollution generated um, by the way they manage waste in eastern North Carolina, um, I think Smithfield would be pretty motivated to come up with a different system um, that was less risky. But because that liability sits entirely with each individual person operating a hog farm, it becomes much more difficult um, to, to make change and to hold, um, certainly to hold these big meat companies accountable. So one, one last thing I wanna say here. Um, when when you as a farmer sign a contract with one of these big meat companies, you essentially lose your economic independence entirely. So you've, be, you've gone from owning a small independent local business, your small farm, um, to basically signing a contract and becoming entirely beholden to one of these big meat corporations. Um, there are lots and lots of issues with how growers are compensated for running these factory farms. We don't have time to get into that today. Um, Jamie Oliver has a great piece from several years ago on Last Week Tonight about this, um, which I highly recommend you look up if you want to learn more. Um, but it's, this is not a good system in which to be a farmer. So these factory farms produce enormous amounts of waste. We know this. Um, they fuel climate change. We're beginning to know to, and to understand more and more about this. Um, they pollute our air and water. They exploit workers. They harm animal welfare. They drive antibiotic resistance and compromise the safety of our food. And they've gutted our rural communities. So why are they still here? Um, and, and so, you know, a lot of people are like, well, we should just get rid of them. Um, and we agree. Um, but, you know, they are still here because these corporations that, that have invented and run this model have an enormous amount of power, um, but also for three other reasons. And that is because we don't enforce our environmental laws in this country. Um, 
The second is because we have a huge glut of cheap corn that is the result of bad farm policy and bad farm bills. Um, and the third is because we don't enforce our antitrust laws, which has allowed these companies to amass monopoly power. So we'll talk about each of these. Um, first, our environmental laws are not enforced. Um, this is a Cape River Watch picture. I cut the, cut the credit off, but it is, um, of a full lagoon breach after Hurricane Florence. Um, this was on the South River, actually upstream from where Kemp and I live. So um, this was a lagoon that leached, you know, its entire couple million gallons of um, raw hog manure into floodwaters, which, you know, then ran downstream um, into people's homes, um, including ours. <laughs> um, so our kind of bedrock environmental laws in this country um, could be used to rein in pollution from factory farms, but they aren't. Um, these are laws that you know of and you've heard of, the Clean Water Act primarily, but also the Clean Water Act, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, several others. Um, for decades, EPA's lax approach to factory farms has allowed this industry to freely pollute our waterways. So um, the Clean Water Act clearly defines a CAFO as a point source of pollution, meaning that it should be regulated by a permit that determines what it can discharge into our rivers and streams. Um, but due to EPA's weak enforcement, only a small percentage of factory farms in this country have the required permits. Um, and by EPA's own estimate, there are 10,000 large factory farms across this country that should have permits but don't, and so are illegally discharging into our waterways. Um, even the permits that do exist are notoriously weak and don't adequately protect water quality. Um, so these permits generally only limit nutrient and pathogen pollution, which is really important. But when we're talking about factory farm waste, um, there's all kinds of other really, really dangerous stuff in that waste. Antibiotics, artificial growth hormones, pesticides, heavy metals, the list goes on and on. Um, and so EPA doesn't even touch those contaminants. Um, and then moreover, and this is particularly relevant here in Eastern North Carolina, um, you know, the EPA is continuing to allow these facilities to dump huge amounts of untreated waste directly onto land even when no crops are growing. You know, it's not like we're fertilizing crops with this manure. We're not even pretending to do that. We're just dumping this waste to get rid of it. Um, this is the lagoon and spray field system that obviously results in, you know, just regularly this waste seeping into the soil and running off into our rivers and streams, but occasionally catastrophic issues like this. Um, and so the main takeaway here is that EPA could be doing lots, lots more um, to regulate this industry if only it had the political will to do it. Um, second, we have decades of misguided farm policy that has resulted in this glut of corn and other commodity crops that provides cheap feed for factory farms. Um, so this is another thing we could talk for, for two days about, but um, We'll talk primarily about the Farm Bill. So the Farm Bill establishes the policies and government supports for a wide range of U.S. agricultural products. Um, it is reauthorized every five years. Um, it is up for reauthorization this year. The Farm Bill was first passed in the 30s as part of the New Deal. Um, and we used to have really good farm policy in this country that really did support small, independent, diversified farms. Um, but over the course of the last like 50 years, um, that has kind of started to shift. And at first it was little by little to, to really kind of incentivize um, consolidation in the industry. Um, but then in 1996, that was the, the farm bill that kind of wiped out farm policy as we knew it and replaced it with what we have now. Um, farm bills are, they have names. I, I don't know why this is, but um, the 1996 bill was called Freedom to Farm. Um, and we, we call it Freedom to Fail. Um, but so that 1996 bill enacted a new market-based approach to farm policy that primarily benefits corporate agribusiness. Um, and so since then, our modern farm bills have essentially um, aggressively incentivize the overproduction of commodity crops like corn and soy um, that are then turned into feed for factory farms. So your tax dollars and mine through the funding of federal crop insurance and some of these other programs are actually helping to prop up the factory farm market um, or the factory farm model by creating all of this cheap feed. 
Um, and then finally, we don't enforce our antitrust laws in this country. Um, these are the, the, you know, the corporate fat cats. Um, so antitrust refers to policies that are focused on preventing or controlling trusts or monopolies with the intention of promoting consol or, um, competition in business. We have a number of laws in this country that deal with antitrust. There's one specific to food and agribusiness. It's called the Packers and Stockyards Act of 1921. This law was passed in 1921. It has literally never been properly used. Um, it should preference fairness and competition, um, and it doesn't do that. So this, it's you know, at this point, it's it's 100 years old. It's ineffective. It's outdated. Um, it has created an unfair market that preferences corporate power instead of fairness and competition. Um, it contains what we call an undue preference provision that should level the playing field for small and independent growers, but those provisions have never been enforced by either USDA or the courts. Um, and so that has really allowed this model to flourish. Um, this has allowed the murder, mergers um, and acquisitions that are really rampant in the food and agribusiness space. Um, and you know, this benefits, again, um, these wealthy corporations instead of us as eaters and the farmers who grow our food. And then lastly, um, it's important to throw this in because it's a lot of money. Um, agribusiness has spent over a billion dollars lobbying our elected officials um, just from 1990 to 2020. Um, and so this is an enormous amount of money. These are campaign contributions that they're making to our elected officials in order to buy influence, um, which helps them in turn then buy the public policy that they want to see. Um, so very difficult to compete with a um, with billion dollars in campaign contributions um, over, over this amount of time. All right. So. I think, I, th I think we've hammered home um, the point that this, this farm and food system is not working. Um, so let's talk now about how we're going to fix it. Um, so again, we need policy change to fix this problem. Um, food and Water Watch was the first national organization to call for an outright ban on factory farms. Um, we were sitting around a conference room table in our office in DC in 2017 and we were talking about you know kind of our strategic approach to this issue over the coming couple years and it was lots of legal work and regulatory work and um, and one of our staff looked at us across the table and was like we should just get rid of factory farms <laughs> and, and we were like yes we should just get rid of factory farms um, so you know even the best regulated factory farm which is le like legal fiction it doesn't exist even the best regulated factory farm is still a factory farm and so if you live in a rural place like we live five miles from the nearest factory farm but we can smell it at our house like who wants that right so um there's a, there's a misconception out there that people, you know, really, really like this model and this model is like really working in rural America. And that's really not the case unless you're running one of these facilities. Um, and so we just decided we wanted to call for an outright ban. Um, we know this is very visionary. It took a long time to get to this point in our food system. It will take a long time to dismantle it. Um, but organizationally, we believe in asking for what we really want. Um, and, and I think that you know, by naming what you really want, that's kind of the first step to getting it. Um, and so, so that's where we are. So our legislative priorities over the coming several years are focused on um, policies that will move us away from the factory farm model and toward a model that allows the people who grow our food to earn a living, um, to practice environmental stewardship, and to rebuild the infrastructure that we need for a local and regional food system. And so there are several current opportunities. Um, the first is the Farm System Reform Act. This is the most exciting, in my opinion. Um, so this bill was introduced in 2020 for the first time by Senator Cory Booker and Representative Ro Khanna. Um, Food and Water Watch helped to write this piece of legislation, as did Waterkeeper Alliance and a number of other, other groups. Um, so this bill would halt the construction of new and expanding factory farms immediately. It would put in place an immediate moratorium on new and expanding factory farms. And it would phase out existing large operations by 2040. Um, it would provide 
a huge pot of money, $100 billion um, for a voluntary buyout program for people that are currently stuck in the factory farm model um, to be able to transition to more sustainable and humane forms of agriculture. Um, and it also contains a number of market provisions that would make it possible for small and independent farmers to compete. The second, this is a mouthful, um, the Food and Agribusiness Merger Moratorium and Antitrust Review Act. Um, this is legislation that would place an immediate and indefinite moratorium on acquisitions and mergers in the food and agriculture sector, um, which would really do a lot to kind of press pause on like, you know, growing and growing corporate power in the sector. Um, this bill would also establish a commission that would study and publish recommendations to merger enforcement and antitrust oversight in this country um, and in the food and farm sector in particular. This bill was introduced by Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren, John Tester, and Jeff Merkley in the Senate and by Representative Mark Pocan in the House. Um, if those names don't mean anything to you, um, the one takeaway here is that several of those folks are actually from farm states um, in the Midwest. And so it's exciting to see um, some of these, you know, more conservative legislators from farm states getting on board with stronger antitrust enforcement. Um, the antitrust work is interesting. We have some very odd bedfellows in this work, um, but, you know, bipartisan appeal of, of some of this antitrust policy. Um, and so we're hopeful that we, we're going to get somewhere with, with this legislation or at least with pieces of it. Um, the third, so the Biden administration's USDA is now revisiting um, pieces of the Packers and Stockyards Act. Um, this is a long overdue series of rulemakings, like, you know, 100 years overdue. Um, but the provisions that they're revisiting, um, if changed, could really enact new protections for farmers and ranchers and help tamp down on some of the monopoly power that exists in this sector. Um, these rulemakings started about a year ago. The Biden administration is doing some interesting stuff on antitrust. Um, and so we're internally, we are, um, we're pretty optimistic that we might get something done with these rulemakers, rulemakings, which could make a real difference in the lives of contract farmers um, and also independent farmers who are trying to compete. And then finally, I mentioned the farm bill. Um, so the farm bill, you know, the farm bill is a critical opportunity to fundamentally transform our food and farm policy. Um, we are likely to see another farm bill that's very similar to the last, pretty pro-corporate. Um, but there are some conversations about some, some smaller improvements in this year's farm bill that could really make a difference to ensure functional and fair markets. Um, and so what we're actually advocating for um, is that pieces of these other priorities that I just mentioned, the Farm System Reform Act, the Packers and Stockyards Act rulemaking, um, and the merger moratorium bill be included in this year's farm bill. Um, and those conversations are, are going pretty well. I can't, I can't say that we're gonna have a like, transformational farm bill in 2023, um, but we have to start somewhere. Um, and it does seem like we have some opportunities before us, which is exciting. And then the last thing I'll just say, um, we need policy change. This is a policy issue. It will be solved by policy change. Um, there's a growing movement of farmers and consumers out there working to rebuild local food systems and put more profit back in the hands of independent farmers. But really only structural changes at the federal level are gonna create equity in our food system. And so what we need to do is elect um, elected officials who share our values, who put people before profits and before corporate power, and who will be allies in building the food system that we deserve, um, elected officials who aren't beholden to corporate ag. Um, and so that starts with us um, voting for candidates who share our values. All right, so real quickly, um, if you wanna learn more or get involved, um, the first thing you could do is text FSRA, which is Farm System Reform Act, um, to 23321. Um, you'll get action alerts and mobile alerts from Food and Water Watch's campaign to ban factory farms. Um, Foodopoly is a great resource if you really want to nerd out about farm policy. I highly recommend it. Um, it was written by Winona Howder, our executive director. Um, it's a couple years old now at this point, but the, la the landscape is, is pretty, pretty much the same, um, and it's now in audiobook format. I actually think Cape Fear River Watch has a copy floating around here someplace, so you could probably borrow it from them. Um, 
Finn Waterwatch has a great research team and has a lot of research on um, a lot of the issues that we talked about today. So you could check that out on our website, which is foodandwaterwatch.org. Um, we have a new report, which I'll just flag, called Well Fed, um, which is really our vision for how we build a new sustainable food system that works for us as consumers and also for farmers. Um, and it actually features an independent farmer from North Carolina. Um, and it's, it's like beautifully laid out in digital format. So I recommend that. And then finally, you're all here because you're already doing this, but support local organizations working on um, factory farm issues. A lot of change happens at the local level, and it's really important to get involved um, where you live. And with that, um, my watch died, so I don't know what time it is, but I think, that, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, well, I think we have a few minutes. Um, thank you for the mm -hmm. presentation. We'll, uh, Yeah. might be a naive question, but if, if you have a factory farm organization there and you get rid of Big Brother up here that's telling them how to do it and everything, you turn it back all over to that farmer. He's got this infrastructure. He, he knows how to do, do it this way. He's out of control. What's going to keep them from doing the same thing except that instead of the profits going to Big Brother up the road, it's going to be the farmer just yeah. I, 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 maybe it's a dumb guy question. No, 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 that's a great question. Um, so that's part of the reason we are advocating for a moratorium or a ban on these facilities entirely. So, you know, if the Farm System Reform Act were to pass and to enact this um, moratorium on these facilities, you wouldn't be able to run one of these farms after 2040. Um, and there's a, that huge pot of money, that billion dollar voluntary buyout program will be to support farmers who are, who are making that transition from the contract farming model into more sustainable forms of agriculture. Um, and so, you know, it's gonna cost a lot of money and it's gonna take a lot of time, but essentially what we're advocating for is a point at which you can't run a factory farm or a CAFO in this country because it's against the law. Um, and so, you know, it will, it will take, there will be a transition and that's why, um, you know, the moratorium on new facilities in the Farm System Reform Act would take act effect immediately, um, but existing facilities won't be required to be phased out for a number of years so that there's time for people to make that transition. Okay, dumb guy question number two. What are the mechanics of that transition? How do you do that? Yeah, so um, I would encourage you to look at WellFed on our, on our website because that'll, that'll go into more detail there. Um, but essentially, we need to rebuild a local food, local and regional infrastructure for our food system. So, you know, we need to return to a time where animals are raised on small diversified farming operations and slaughtered in small independent facilities that are located you know, all, all across the country rather than having these enormous slaughterhouses in like three different cities in one state, right? And so that's the first thing is that we need to, um, we need to rebuild the infrastructure that makes it possible to process animals and slaughter animals at the, the regional, like at a regional local scale, um, rather than relying on these big facilities like the Tar Heel facility. Um, and then, you know, we need to shift our farm policy so that we're actually incentivizing people to grow food um, that we as consumers can actually eat. So, you know, the biggest part of the farm bill is to prop up um, the production of these commodity crops like corn and soy, which are then pumped into cheap feed for factory farms. Those aren't things that we as, you know, actual people are going to eat. So what we need to do is shift our farm policy that we're, so that we're incentivizing people to, instead of, you know, focusing on corn and soy, grow, you know, beans and lettuce and grains and things that we as consumers actually need. Um, so that's it. We could talk for days about that. Um, and well-fed, the well-fed report has lots of different, um, almost like vignettes of farmers who are doing it the right way to talk about the policy changes um, that we need in order to make that happen. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering about um, where else besides the food co-op here in town can you support local farmers? There's a wonderful Saturday morning market at the food co-op every Saturday. But where else in town, who else is supporting farmers and using local things? And how do we publicize that? Yeah, I'll just step in here. We have a list on our website of, of local sustainable farms. It's about 12 or 15 on there that, that folks can check out. And those are farms that 
the vast majority of, maybe 100% of those, we've actually visited and talked to those farmers and, and know those <coughs> farmers well. But um, so, so there, there are some. There obviously are not nearly enough because of this system, the way it's built, makes that really difficult. But there are some, and, and we have listed those and contact information for those, and we periodically kind of send a reminder out, like around the holidays, about you know how you can think about maybe supporting local farmers when you're thinking about these big meals, and then around like July Fourth, we usually send something out. Wasn't there a, a system of you could? Connect with a farm, and they would deliver deliver groceries to yeah. you. A lot, a lot of these farms, that that, right? That? That, that, there's a Chrissy mentioned this uh, community supported agriculture programs where you contact a farm and you pay in advance frequently to that farmer so that they can plan around. Uh, they they get money in advance, which allows them to to grow crops, which they can then distribute to the people who bought into that system throughout the growing season. Uh, and it gives you a chance to get good local fresh produce and, and meat and eggs um, and support those farms and allows them a little bit of security knowing that they've got kind of customers that are willing to pay in advance. I just want to push back a little bit as a result of the conversations that I had with an actual farmer uh, recently. I don't know how many of you actually know actual farmers, but. Um, this man has a farm. Um, I met him at the beach. Actually, we were talking about fishing because we used to fish together. He lives in um, South Carolina, has a, a 200 acre farm right across the border from North Carolina, about, um, about two hours inland from here. He has 200 acres. He raises soybeans, wheat, corn, and hogs. Okay. Um, He's not the stereotype that you would think of. He's really smart. He's married, married to a Middle Eastern woman, woman that he met at Clemson University when he was in agriculture there. He's, he's retirement age now. He has three children. They've all been through 4-H and all this kind of thing. They're, one, of us, one of them is a large animal veterinarian. Um, and. Um, very successful veterinary business, mainly taking care of racehorses. Um, but he is in a situation where this farm that he raised, that he runs, and he had, he raised his hogs for Smithfield. Um, he that was not his choice. That family has owned the farm for not for nine generations. Uh, at least he claims. I, that sounds a little fantastical to me, but that's what he claims. And um, he he wants to he wants to retire. He's he's eighty, and um, none of his children want to do this. None of them want to deal with the problems. And the problem he was dealing with when I talked to him was his tractor. He leases this immensely expensive tractor. And he was trying to get parts for it. He spent the last two days trying to get his tractor running. And he's dealt with all the problems over the years. He's really well trained. There are no independent. This, this, that original, your original chart there of, of the, um, uh, the funnel. I don't know if you could go back to that. But the original uh, thing for me is had all these. We don't know any of these people. But we also have stereotypes of who these people are and what kind of values they have. So, I mean, I, you're as, you did a terrific overview of this thing and kind of filled in some gaps in my understanding of this. But the real people involved, there is no kind of future for. Oh, I don't. I don't think we disagree with that. <laughs> I mean, th this so system what, is not working for so anyone. How are these people going? What are these people going to do? So, um, I work with a number of farming organizations in the Midwest. Um, I am on the phone with farmers almost every day. 
um, and I go to their conferences and I go to their meetings and I hear their stories about how difficult it is to survive in this environment. So I also spent, um, I'll just, I'll lay out my, my rural credibility for you here. I spent 12 years in Western Pennsylvania um, where I had a dairy farm on one side of my property and a dairy farm on the other side of my property. And I sat on one of those gentlemen's porches when he told me that he was selling or he was signing a fracking lease because he could not afford to continue to lose money running this dairy farm. So um, I am not a farmer myself. Um, but I feel like I work with a lot of people who are really struggling to survive in this system. Um, and, you know, I think the argument that we are making here is that this system isn't working for independent farmers, it's not working for contract farmers, it's not working for us as people who eat food in this country, it's working for these giant agribusiness corporations. And, you know, one of the problems here that you kind of touched on is that most of us don't know where our food is grown. You know, with the exception of the box that we get from, from Red Beard Farms CSA every week, I have no idea where the food I'm buying at Harris Teeter is grown. And it's most likely in like, you know, in California, right? Like it's not local. Um, and so part of the problem is that we've become, you know, because of the nature of this system, we've become so disconnected from the food that we eat um, that, that we're not in touch with you know, where our food is grown or how it's produced or how animals, you know, that we, we're later consuming are being treated. Um, and so I, I'm not sure I fully understand your question, but I, you know, the argument that I'm making here is that um, this system of, of corporate agriculture that we have in this country is not, it's not working for the guy you know in South Carolina just as much as it's not working for the independent farmers that I work with in the Midwest. Yeah. I was in education all my life, and um, I'm still in education, but uh, I, I'm picturing people saying, well, why can't I have grapes when they're not in season? Or why, uh, if just because they don't grow them, why, do I, why can't I have tomatoes? Yeah. And I think there's so much education to the whole w United States. Yeah. It, it, to me, it's mind-boggling. Mind yeah. Thank you for the part yeah. you're trying to do. Yeah. No, it's it's very difficult. Um, you know, I mean, I want, like, strawberries in my smoothie in November, right? Um, Barbara Kingsolver wrote a great book several years ago called Animal Vegetable Miracle that talks about her trying to eat locally for an entire year in, like, the southern Appalachian Mountains. Um, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy, especially when you, I mean, it would be easier here, but like it's pretty difficult when you live in a place that has a winter. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot to that. Um, we, we want what we want when we want it. Um, and that, you know, that demand does help to prop up the system. Uh, yeah. So we are just about at time, so I'm gonna cut it off there, but um, if you're willing to hang out a little bit, yeah. and then if folks do still have questions, you can come up um, and ask Tracy a um, one-on-one. I did want to make a, a quick reminder that we actually will not be having a June seminar because our State of the River event is two days prior on Thursday, June 1st. So we will not have a Saturday seminar on June 3rd. So just want to make that quick announcement. And if you have a moment and can just hold up your chair and lean it against the wall for us, we'd really appreciate that too. Uh, thank you guys.